Well, hey everybody. So this is the Collab Talks the post Tweet Jam interview, and today I'm here with Daryl Webster. Hey, Daryl, thanks for taking your Saturday morning because this is unusual for us. We're this is the first time we've done a Tweet Jam on a Friday afternoon because mm. we were aligned with the M365 Chicago event, and it was the closing the end note for that. And they're on Central Time, so an hour ahead of me. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's, you know, but hopefully you got some, a good night's sleep. You weren't oh, like, awake for it's, a- it's just gone past, uh, one o'clock here in the afternoon. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a convenient time for me rather than getting up at sort of three, four, five in the morning. I, you have joined cause we are generally, we do our tweet jams at 9am Pacific yeah. and that is, yeah. yeah. That's not a good time for you, I realize. And yet, sometimes you're on those. So I always appreciate. I always point that out when you're able to join one of those tweet jams. But <laughs> Thank you. Well, this yeah. the topic this month was the Microsoft 365 adoption in a post-COVID work-from-home world. Uh, and I know that uh, – so you had some great uh, – your tweets are out there. There was a, a sizable panel of experts, and as well, we had the uh, – you know, the live panel, the video at the same time going on for the mm. Chicago event. But let's just kick things up. Well, why don't you introduce yourself first, and then we'll start going through the questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'm uh, from Auckland, New Zealand, so I am out on the edge of the world. Uh, and I think, like, part of the reason why uh, I've joined Tweet Jams like this and become part of the, the virtual community is I am way off in the distance i'm in middle earth as some some people say too um so i've learned to use tools like this to connect with people and get to know people like christian and getting into the tech community and chatting and stuff i work in uh the user adoption and change management space um for microsoft 365 and i call myself an adoption architect because it sounds flasher um and yeah, I, I enjoy um, enabling organizations to make the most of their modern workplace. Well, very cool. Well, thanks for joining. And again, so we'd love to get your perspective on these. So the first question that we posted is we always, you know, it's an hour long. It's always very fast moving. Uh, mm. And there's you because you're trying to follow via Twitter, you know, these side conversations and people make great points. You're trying to comment back and then suddenly the next question is there. Um, so seven questions. Well, an hour. I used I used to yeah. track this time, Christian. I, mean, I know oh. that you post these questions early, which is great because it gives us time to think about it, give us a considered response. This time, I used the save as draft feature for tweets, and I stringed a few, and then I just hit tweet all each time, so then I could focus on everyone else's responses and engage with them. It was really good. See, I and I have all of my so not not so many there's responses. Sometimes I do, but of course I have all my tweets that are written out in OneNote and paste them over so I queue them up there because I've got a there's a cadence to the questions that I try to mm. there's a little bit of flexibility there. But uh, so question one, uh, with most organizations forced to quickly move to remote work, what has worked well and where have companies struggled? Yeah, the um, answer I gave, and and it's something that I experienced as I was trying to move our own workplace into using Microsoft Teams, that uh, quickly became my focus, get ourselves um, ready to help our customers first. Uh, And the the biggest challenge for us was honestly not a technical one. It was more about having established lines of communication to, to try and coordinate some of the efforts around working from home and what did we need and what we need to do um, and this strangely enough is is one key need for adoption and change management if you don't have clear lines of communication and people that uh, you respect and you can um, you receive the message from them then you're you're going to be floundering and that's what we found was our biggest challenge yeah I, and i made this of course we kind of come back in and out the questions there's some overlap I made a comment you know, later in the hour, um, but I think it's relevant here. Um, I've been working from home, working remotely for over a decade. And, and as you know, um, when you have the majority of people that are in a shared office and when you're out in the field, they often forget about you. Oh, Something yeah. that has uh, 
so I, so I, here's the here's the 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 correlation here. So I for a year of my life, um, I commuted uh, when living in California on a motorcycle. When I stopped, when I got back to my car and commuted again, longer commute, I realized how much more aware of motorcycles that I was. Yeah, and conscious of and protective of bikes on the road. And the same thing I think will happen, even if the majority of people go back into that office environment. Um, they will become more aware of those people who are remote. I I hope, I think that will be the case. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, I think that this has also had an effect on the uh, focus of Microsoft's development in the space for remote work. I know that, look, they create the tech and, and there are a good portion of their people that do work remotely and work from all sorts of places across the world. But I think by... Uh, many people having to work from home um, that it, it brought that focus on, hey, we've really got to improve our meeting experience here. We've really got to try and uh, bring different ways to to coach the interaction, raise hand features, looking at the breakout rooms coming, all those sorts of things about wrapping up meetings. Um, so it was really good to see that um, be a focus. Yep. Well, question two was, uh, are there Microsoft 365 features that you didn't use prior to COVID that are now go-to tools in your toolbox? Yes, yes. Um, look, I had looked briefly at my, my analytics and I looked at it and thought, eh, yeah, this is okay, this is fine. I think maybe because I was working uh, in a smaller organization at the time, uh, Adopt and Embrace, that I saw its value, but I didn't really give it much um, airtime. And I think it was actually Lorian Strand who uh, showed me a bit around how he used uh, focus time as part of the My, My Analytics services. And he said, look, uh, you can use this plan and it, it can schedule in two hours uh, into your calendar. Or oh, focus time, I thought, oh, great. Um, I'm in the habit of exposing my uh, subjects and details of my calendar to um, the whole org. Actually, I don't. I don't mind that people see what it is that I have planned, so that they can judge whether or not they want to schedule time over the top of it instead mm -hmm. of just free busy. But focus time allowed me to show, hey, this is what I'm going to. I'm going to spend at least two hours um, on on a task, and then what I do, and Lauren suggested again was really good, was you actually put your task alongside that focus time, and it's like double scheduling that time, so you know what you're working on, but here's that protected time. Um, yeah. And I do find you do have to protect it. Sometimes people look at it, ah, you just focus time, right? So you're like, no, I schedule that for a reason, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, uh, I, you know, I used to have that philosophy as well as it's allow everyone to see what's happening on my calendar. Like if you have a doctor's appointment or something, you can always go in and make that private. You can yeah. you know, kind of hide that. But I, I for the same reason, it's, it's uh, so if people are aware, especially if you have d direct reports, so they know what you're focused on, I think is really important there. Uh, especially, uh, which I've had where people come in and like, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Like this is much more urgent. Like, Oh, you know, you're right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So question number three. So what are the biggest roadblocks to Microsoft 365 user adoption today? Um, there are, there are a few, again, I think it is, you know, what, one of the, the trends I saw in, in Colab talk today was, uh, the pace of change, the the features that are just being pushed on out there, and this this nature that's been built around. Oh, it's new. I've got to understand it. Um, I've got to use it, and you know, therefore you're you're like, well, hang on. I was just trying to get used to this thing over here, and now there's this new thing. Uh, I think there's still a need for organisations to have one, two, or a body of people that, that do evaluate what's new and coming so they can determine where it fits in priority. Um, so there is that, the pace of change. I think there's also still some, some gaps and things around security and compliance that some organizations still feel, look, that's not really going to fit within, within our needs and, and still fit our compliance requirements. Um, yeah, coming across some things where you might make a choice and settings further up the chain in Azure AD and as it filters down that means that you can't do certain things but you can do certain things over here um, but yeah on, on an adoption standpoint um, pace of change I think because a lot of people are still 
working through just what they need to do. I mean, look, we, we live technology. Um, and so we, we're always looking at change, but it's that's because it's primarily our part of our job. Other people have got other things to do and, and they just tend to take things on board just gradually, slowly, don't deliver too much to me or I'm just going to shut you off. <laughs> I like this. In fact, I, I shared one of your tweets, uh, responses to this question with the panel. And I said, you know, it, it really needs to be a cultural change. You need to, if you're a manager, if you're an organizational leader, to let people know that unless it's their jobs, like they're the change management people to keep up on every minute feature iterative change to the platform. Uh, it's okay to to not be on top of that stuff, focus on the work that needs to be done and on the yeah. end work-life balance. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be repeatedly, you know, again, within the culture of your organization, um, it needs, people need to be reminded of that. Like, Focus on the work. What are the right tools for you to get your work done? And, uh, you know, and as new features and we've had more time to kind of go through it and, and think about it and the impact, and then let's move that into and adopt that within the organization. It's mm. okay to not be on top of every last thing. It's the, it's the FOMA. It's the fear of missing out. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a real thing. And, and, I mean, certainly for us, for MVPs, I think there's the, the the FOMA, while we may deny it a lot, but of course, a lot of our jobs are keeping on top of, you know, what's happening with the technology. Um, but even then, uh, I'm okay to let a lot of things pass by and instead rely on my community connections, um, like your podcast, your vlog stuff. Like, I know that, Hey, I saw that Daryl covered this and Daryl Daniel have this. I'm going to go and I'll catch up with that at the end of the week. And I don't need to go and dive into it midweek. Um, so, you know, mm. find those find those resources that you can tap into and make time for it later during the focus. Yeah, exactly. During the focus zone. I think it's important to to slow down and see where this fits into a relevant scenario. Like you can you can pull out 50 different features and say these these are 50 tips that I've got for teams and I, I watch them okay because I want to catch up with how people are talking about things and what they think and their viewpoints but so often it's go over here into the product and do this and go over here and do that and it's like well can we just string things together so that it all makes sense because a scenario is going to stick with me a yeah. little tip is going to be forgotten in an instant <laughs> right well there's a uh... There's an opportunity. Well, as you know, you Tom Duff and I do our productivity tips, and they're all just to that point. They're all yeah. over the place, and we've talked about going in and writing uh, eBooks where we capture of all the tips, not gather all of them, but say for teams, here's the 50 we've shared in the last 12 months, mm. but we'll edit it down to where it makes sense. There's a flow of it. We'll categorize that based on those features. So I think that there's value add that we can do of course time to put something that together that's the issue we have yeah 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 um let's see so question number four uh with so many people foregoing the commute and working where they live what are your recommendations for ensuring work-life balance i i like this thought of a virtual commute right um so okay first of all um my main goal is scheduling my work and I've, I guess I've done that more often now as as we've shifted into remote work and working from home. It gives me focus, but I'm also scheduling my availability. So if I am going to work from an 8.30 to you know 5.30 day, that's great. Maybe I've got a chunk of time at some time where I've got to do other things during the day because of family needs, whatever, you know, that happens. Um, so it's great to have flexible time, but I do try and schedule focus time, time for tasks, and also time to be available for people. Um, so that helps me to set some rough boundaries. Uh, but this virtual commutes uh, thinking, um, walking down the hallway and literally trying to put some distance between me and my machine, walking up the, the road and, and, and taking a break away from even the, the building. I mean, we're lucky to be able to do that here in New Zealand and, um, you know, just just get out. Uh, I know some are still uh, very much about staying inside and isolating. 
Um, but these are important things. Distance yourself from your tech. <laughs> yeah. It, I, it's it's funny. My my kids, more than anybody, get frustrated with me. On the weekends, I set my phone down. And they're like, I've been trying to text you. I'm like, yeah, I've been upstairs in my, my, off, my basement office. My phone is down on my desk. It's sitting on its little charger pad right back there, and mm-hmm. and there it'll it'll sit, and unless I'm going somewhere and need it, like and I'll I'll miss, you know, miss that where during the week, you know, somebody can text me, and minutes later I'm able to respond back. But uh, that's a very intentional thing, and that's where I would add mm. is like be be intentional about the time that you have set up and stick to that that schedule. So when I'm yeah. when I'm here in the command center. I'm present, I'm focused, I'm working, but like you, and I, I'll, I'll get up and when I'm upstairs and I, I, I leave this behind, I'll be back after I eat lunch, you know, and I'll come yeah. back. But, um, Manage those channels, right? If you've got, if you've got lots of channels open for communication for people to reach you, you've got to learn to shut some of those things off or right. that constant changing of context is going to drive you nuts i i have to say that it's it's really funny when you look at people sharing through social networks uh you know some like uh, somebody out on a like a facebook marketplace and uh, you see something similar to this every once in a while they're selling something and they'll come in and and see that you know 15 minutes ago somebody asked a question about the product and when they didn't get an answer five minutes later they had a desperate message, then they well, a rude message for not responding, all within the span of 15 minutes. And it had this, this person just demanded instant mm. responses to something. And uh, you see that more and more, and you have to realize that, uh, you know, I, that a lot of that kind of communication, unless we are on the same team or we're working together, and I have that presence awareness to know that you're there, it's an asynchronous connection and my mm-hmm. expectations need to be appropriate for that connection type. Definitely. Question five, with the work from home boom, we've seen more collaboration data and analytics. So you're talking mm-hmm. about the analytics. Uh, how will analytics impact future adoption and management of these platforms? I've been taking a closer look at um, the productivity score recently, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, I have been using the Microsoft 365 analytics dashboard for a while, but the productivity score, um, it actually makes a lot more sense of that data for me as I look closer at it. Um, So I think analytics like this are going to be important for um, driving those best practice behaviors. Now, a part of me also thinks, okay, that's Microsoft's suggested best practice based on Forrester's research and stuff. But you as an org or you as a team or even as an individual have to work out your own best practice. Right. But it's a start. Um, so looking at analytics like that and saying, how often am I connecting with my team? Or how long am I in meetings? And let's go a bit deeper. How are those meetings being run? And uh, are they too long? Uh, do they have an agenda or are, are we just sort of prattling on and and um, there's very little interaction there because it's more of a broadcast? So I think looking at that, those sorts of analytics are going to be important from um, this hybrid and remote work standpoint because we don't have that same connection time or ability to wander over and, and talk to people and, and see those sorts of interactions happening. And I think to your point, too, is that even with Microsoft, the productivity score, it's a cool thing. And it does get smarter over time as more data goes through the system. And and I think that there's like, you know, you know, the Tigraph guys as well. And so they have their their analytics package that they do. And they also have the ability to look at, you know, mm-hmm. based on the customer data that's running through their dash, dashboard in some ways is is you know more granular in certain areas than what Microsoft provides through their their uh, dashboards, but it's a it, you you have to um, look beyond just the data. You have to then have the hard conversations of what does this actually mean? It you know, what yeah. does this mean for our organization? Even with the productivity score to come back to those recommendations, you need yeah. to then understand how Microsoft is providing that, what the data is saying about that, and then what that actually translates inside your organization about mm. how people are actually working and what to go and do next. Yeah. Uh, let's see, question number six. Uh, I like this one. Uh, 
Without the promise of cookies and the smell of popcorn to entice participation, <laughs> how can you yeah. successfully virtualize adoption efforts for a work from home organization? You are you are limited, aren't you? I mean, you can't really deliver things to people. Or maybe maybe if you arrange some kind of uh, online delivery service, um, we well, won't apparently name, for name this here. Chicago this Chicago event. Apparently, they sent coupons or something to. They paid for pizza for every speaker. Wow. And, That's really uh, cool. Yeah, I thought that that was a smooth move. Yeah. They had some yeah. limited sponsorships, but they had a little bit of funding and they were able to do that for their speakers. That was really cool. Um, adoption campaigns. How do we make them more interactive when we've only got this flat screen here <laughs> available to us and some audio? Um, like I, I saw some good suggestions and, and it reminded me, um, uh, who was it? I think it was Noah Sparks who reminded me of the the um, scavenger uh, hunt. Scavenger hunts. Yes, My goodness. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I know uh, they don't have to feel like the uh, childish and basic. They can actually be quite advanced and re really quite um, quite amazing. But about trying to follow that trail, going through certain activities and doing something, getting a result and proving that you've done it reminded me of a um a youth group um thing that i did years ago where we all just given those throwaway cameras and we had to go around all these different right. places in auckland in, in our cars and um yeah take pictures to prove that we've done it uh so similar sort of thing um yeah look you can't do food i think it's it is definitely um about providing a mechanism for conversation ongoing conversation so it's one thing to have you and i meeting and, and doing things, but people are going to have ideas, feedback, questions and answers. And that's where, I mean, my suggestion was about take a fresh look at Yammer if you've been pushing it to the side, um, because the communities, the way that they tie into uh, a SharePoint communication site uh, where you're communicating what's happening in this project, what is the, the campaign that we're trying to run, where are the learning resources, put that all together, pull it all together and have a place where people can ask their questions, attend live events, um, and keep that conversation going. I think it's really important. Yeah, you, you know, it's even when we were all in a shared office, uh, you know, training and education, you, you uh, there was no one way to do that. You had mm. to mix it up and try different things. Uh, I think having, rotating the responsibility of different people in the organization, sharing what they've learned or what they've done on their project, um, you know, ha you know, highlighting that having, you know, uh, guest outside speakers come in all things, again, you can do remotely, but be, get creative about, mm. you know, and, and mix it up in the different types of activities that you do. Uh, people need the variety we need to break up the day. We can't just be in an endless series of teams meetings. And like I think uh, Anna Chu was offering to to try and run a karaoke uh, over. <laughs> so <laughs> right, yes. Um, I, mm. I keep seeing all of these, uh, especially like '80s bands, getting together and doing these things. And I, yeah. my my thought too is just like you know, maybe if we're we're all in the same part of the world where we have solid bandwidth, and you can do that, and it comes out as that otherwise it has to be so tightly edited to make it sound good but have you ever tried to sing happy birthday to a team member on a team's call any actually any online call right hilarious timing yeah. is way off <laughs> correct yeah i don't i don't know how you do that but no nope. all right uh so the final question uh does the future of work include a remote first approach what are your predictions of how we will work in the future that yeah, again, I saw some great responses there, and I, I think one that you you had too was around floor space and and what that looks like for. Um, I think it's going to change dramatically. Definitely, but... yeah, yeah. Look, um, there there will still be roles where you you can't work remotely, so they they you know people are going to have to come into their place of work um, for for certain roles, um, but for those who who um, can work remotely. Uh, I think that, that shifting to that hybrid scenario where it's good to have at least maybe one or two days in the office that you can connect with people, that seems to be working well for our team. 
um, we set one day where everyone does come in and then there's an optional day around that that you can choose to come in and connect. Uh, but yeah, I think um, remote first, there's a remote first mindset that we need to have. And you mentioned it earlier. I know Adopt and Embrace, they practiced it too. They actually, they took it one further. So this was, you know, making sure that even people within the office joined a meeting from the laptop, even though they're in the same meeting room. And it was so that we were all in that same experience, headsets on, webcams, um, so that we could all have the equal opportunity to interact in the meeting, uh, rather than a, a free for all in the room and the poor remote people not being able to get a word in over the conference phone. Right. Well, that's why I think that it's, you know, having gone through this shared experience, it, it, it's going to make people more sensitive to uh, those folks that are geographically dispersed. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously the biggest thing that's missing and, and Mark Cashman brought this up in uh, from Microsoft that um, made this, this comment on the panel um, for the Chicago event was, uh, you know, the, the not having the ability to walk down the hall following a meeting and discussing some of the announcements and what came out. Hey, how's this going to impact this thing that we're working on together? And and you know have those kind of you know light touch casual conversations. Mm. Go grab lunch and build those personal connections. And it it takes more work to do that. Um, yeah, in a virtual yeah, it does. environment. So we're limited by we're limited by like one audio tech. You and I can talk right now, and sometimes we cross over the top of each other. But there's enough of a signal and a delay or whatever that we can we can manage that. As soon as you add four, five, six, ten, twenty people in, it becomes a one at a time thing. So breakout rooms and things like that are going to be important. But I do want to see more development around smart audio tech that gives us that opportunity for more people to interact. Maybe the virtual way of doing what Mark was talking about is you plan your meeting to be 45 minutes long, you deliver your content, and then you say, we're gonna go into breakout rooms for the last 15, where you can talk and discuss and react and think about it. Yep, I, I'm i excited to get that feature and, and play with that as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, uh, you're right, you know, sometimes in, and it gets overwhelming when there's too many people, um, but having the ability to have that crosstalk is important, you know, and, and there could be, uh, you know, side conversations that are going there. You know, uh, uh, it, somebody made a comment. It wasn't today. It was a, a I don't know, a, a, it may have been, uh, you know, a call the last couple of days about how they thought that the hand raise feature in Teams was going to be a huge thing. It was high demand. But mm. the, the, this person commented that, like, hardly anybody uses that feature. Well, in the panel today, I started doing that at where I, I needed to, as I was running the tweet jam while the panel was going and it came to that time where I posted the new question. And so I raised my hand and somebody would finish their point and they would just naturally just kind of pause for the next person. And I would say, hey, I had my hand raised. Here's the next question to move mm. on to. And it, it kind of made that, you know, natural break. Um, it just seemed to work, but you need to, I think, discuss that, make it part of the etiquette, part of the culture yeah. of the organization to utilize yeah. that. But Yeah, no, I agree. And, and, and you and I were in a meeting, I think it was yesterday, similar sort of thing where um, one or two of us slipped into that role of moderating to say such yeah. and such has had their hand raised or just just politely handing it off that. I've I've just had my hand raised. I've had my turn to talk. I'm going to now look through the list and say, oh, there's there's another person handing over to that person. Right. Agreed. Well, Daryl, really appreciate your time going through. Thanks again for participating today. People That's want to great. get in touch with you, follow you. What are the best ways to find you? Um, I am um, Daryl AAS, which is Daryl as a service on Twitter. Uh, you'll find my content now at modernworkplacechange.com. Uh, and Modern Workplace Change on YouTube as well. Excellent. Well, thanks. And we'll uh, hopefully I'll see you next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, vaccines, yeah, yeah. please. Come on. <laughs> I know. All right. Hey, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye now. All right. Bye.